This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas here and now, and I'm Raghu Marcus. As some of you may know, hopefully more than some, I do another podcast called Mind Rolling Podcast. It's uh, myself and uh, my partner David Silver, and both of us have been uh, friends and close to Ramdas for many, many years. And uh, it's a podcast about culture and consciousness, and we try and keep it pretty entertaining. A uh, little more so than here, to say the least. Uh, but uh, the point here is that I uh, have brought up this one particular spiritual teacher uh, that uh, many of us who were with Maharaji had. Well, many of us, not the right word. A number of us, including Ramdas. Ramdas had a very close association with Trumpa Rinpoche uh, from the uh, early 70s. And when we got back from India, and uh, so I have been, touting him isn't the right word, but I certainly, re- I, in my own estimation, I think he's uh, one of the finest teachers to come, have come from, to the West, from the East, and spoke perfect English, which was a, a benefit, certainly. But the big benefit was his ability to translate these teachings into a a more, not really into a more Western vernacular, but in a way that we could understand them far more easily uh, than with other teachers that that came here. Now, of course, His Holiness does a fantastic job. I've been seeing him for many years, so not to um, even uh, differentiate too much there. But Trumpa was a very special uh, teacher for sure. And very much a tantric teacher and using all energy, uh, dated moment to moment, uh, to, uh, transcend, um, separation. So, uh, in, so I have, as I said, I've been, we, David and I bring him up in these podcasts that we do. And, um, and one, I think we did a podcast called, uh, Rascals. And, uh, and we, and Trumpa himself said a great teacher, if, you know, needs to be somewhat rascally so that the students are able to engage the dark side, you know, the shadow side, as Jung would put it. So, um, so we have, you know, we talked about him a lot in this particular, uh, podcast that we did. And we got some feedback. Um, I mean, not a lot, but some interesting feedback. And and one uh, particular um, note that we got through Facebook was from uh, an old friend of mine and was with me and Ramdas and Krishnas in India in, in those days with Maharaji. And he was livid that a, a devotee of Ninkaroli Baba would even bring up this drunkard teacher this, you know, this uh, adulterer and drunkard and God knows what. I mean, he went on. He was really pissed. And um, so therein lies that part of the story. And David and I were like, Jesus, wow. Uh, so in, uh, again, going through the archives that we have here, which I've mentioned uh Many times I get uh, very surprised by different things that I've never heard of. I came across a a talk that Ramdas gave in 1973 uh, when he was seeing uh, working with Trunkpa uh, quite a bit, and uh, he gave an SNC talk on what Trumpa represents, what we can get from it. And, and he talks a lot about how, uh, people would come up to me and to him and say, what is this guy? What is, I mean, drinking and the, you know, the carousing and the chaos and, uh, which Ramdas aptly uh, describes his, and when he was uh, with him. And, and of course, uh, you know, this was, uh, Trumpa wasn't hiding anything. So this, uh, this is quite a talk uh, about, uh, it's something that I have, uh, I do bump into myself. And there's a kind of way in which, um, 
you know, on what, what I guess it's best said and, um, and, and I am going to leave it to Ramdas to say, and by the way, this lecture is, uh, somebody had a handheld microphone to a cassette and there was babies talking and everything. So, um, but we're, we're cleaning it up so that it is, uh, way more, um, clear. So uh, give us a little bit of uh, patience on this. It's well worth it. It really is. Um, uh, I mean, one of the quotes came from somebody who I also have met that Ramdas uh, spent uh, some time with, uh, or uh, certainly uh, a number of visits, was Kalu Rinpoche, another great, great uh, Tibetan Lama the, from the last century. And uh, he was asked, how can, you know, you uh, justify what Trungpa is doing to Buddhism? And, you know, everybody, you know, is following his bad example, you know, partying and God knows what. And he said, when you go to the top of the mountain where the birds fly, don't think you can. <laughs> I love that. Um, but basically, it's... Um, Ramdas is told at one point that um, this is these are very critical times and you must take responsibility, to, you know, in terms of teaching and putting, you know, um, working with uh, neuroses, working with uh, uh, darkness and transforming it and leading people to be able to trans, you know, take some responsibility. And he was incredulous. What responsibility can I take? It's my my guru it's it's he's you know it's all up to him i'm just a, a, a pawn um and he kept saying no you have to assume responsibility and so um this this dichotomy between um you know assuming responsibility and not feeling like the I there is responsible is a lot of what is discussed in this uh, in this talk by Ram Dass. And I think it's very, very critical to uh, understand taking responsibility without the I. So I think that uh, the, there's a lot of talk about identification. We, you know, we have been given something in our case from Ninkaroli Baba and uh, that is, uh, you know, to put it in objective terms, the vehicle, and there's a way in which we need to identify with that vehicle and not identify uh, with it as well. So that's talked about, and uh, crucial information here that uh, basically runs down to, and uh, I'll finish with this, that uh, Ramdas talks about his own confusion about power. And that's where responsibility and power, and he has certainly gone through this in a, in a very, very deep way because of uh, his, the work he's done for so many years and been the focus of attention. So he's saying, in my zeal to get rid of it, I was refusing to participate in it. And I think that's what Trumpa was really talking about. And, uh, um, and there's no resolution here to Trumpa's, uh, the, the way that he, taught the way that he lived his life the example he set uh there's certainly you know uh, i've known people that and i've said this on another podcast that may or may not have been um affected by this in a negative way is that their you know but who would know what the right thing is for anyone the only one i know that about is neem karoli baba in this case of course i have no idea uh, of Trumpa, except that he was, you know, that these things were, came up in, in all of our lives. And, uh, I really feel he gave us a way to transcend them, a way to, uh, to uh, move through them in a way that wasn't denial and, you know, wasn't, you know, fall down, um, addiction <laughs> or something. Um, so here is this, uh, wonderful, uh, a talk that Ram Dass gives somewhere, and again, excuse the sound, it's like, you know, uh, we'll do the best we can here to, to, to make it more better. Uh, and uh, uh, stay tuned for more, because I also found Ram Dass actually interviewing Trumpa, which is uh, also a, a fascinating, wonderful uh, piece of content that uh, uh, we're going to 
uh, I think I'll just put it up uh, in into the next podcast because it's it streams together, and then I can get a lot of uh, uh, you know interesting feedback from people who uh, think that uh, promoting Trumpa is promoting the dark side or something. Anyhow, here we go, Ramdas here and now, and uh, he talks about Trumpa Rinpoche, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. I've had an interesting dialogue this past uh, month or two, a couple of months. Now it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's over a year now. With uh, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. <laughs> and the dialogue, I'll tell you why the dialogue's interesting. Bringing a lineage and a tradition and a set of models, and he's uh, uh, transforming them into the Western metaphor. So that while somebody else would have ridden into a country on a tiger and uh, was absolutely staggering drunk. And I was sitting in the back under a stairwell, just minding my own business. And he sat down, and though he was staggering around, and he had the paralyzed left arm, and he wanted to smoke a cigarette, and he'd stick the cigarette in between the paralyzed fingers at the time, and he'd lift the arm to bring the cigarette to his mouth. And the whole thing had a totally Dr. Strange like uh, in the last pages of um, the DCs or something. Um, but then he spoke, and it was far out. It was like a clear mountain stream. And then afterwards, um, I didn't understand everything he said, because it was a different place he was speaking from that I could understand. It wasn't sort of my metaphor or something. But they said, would you come up and meet Trumpa? So I came up, and I was clinging my, to my mala. I was doing my japa, my bead, doing my bead. And I looked at Trumpa, and I looked into his eyes, and here were these... This was like looking down into two wells, just infinitely deep wells. There just wasn't anything there at all. I mean, no matter where I looked, I couldn't find you were there, you know. Black, pools, or something. Could be just a, some kind of a genetic defect or something. But it, it had a very strange impact because I dropped my beads, which I never do. And he, he bent over and picked them up and handed them to me. See, in his lame, drunken fashion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I went to a seminar of his in Wyoming called Crazy Wisdom which was at the Snow Lion Inn, which was like a Hilton hotel that he had taken over in the uh, Teton village. And this was 30 degrees below temperature. Um, the one lecture a day was given in the middle of the evening for 20 minutes. The rest of the time, except for one day of meditation, was roughly spent either in the bar or in bed, I would say. Roughly. That would be a fair statement. It was sort of like a 10-day party. Really good food, good hotel, good music. Now, um, I had a hard time with that, you know, because um, I've come out of some very holy metaphors. And um, to come into that scene and, you know, it was really confusing, especially since I had agreed with, to go with Allen Ginsberg on a tour to raise money for the meditation center for Trungpa for which this uh, crazy wisdom seminar was my reward, okay? And when I went on this lecture tour, his people were my sort of roadmen and helpers and arrangers, but they were so uninterested in my trip that when I'd start to speak, they'd go out and drink beer until I was done, and then they'd come in and clean up. So I had this strange feeling that I was really being treated like some commodity that was capable of earning the money they needed for the meditation, which was okay. I was known as a love and lighter, all right? <laughs> And I would come into the um, houses, the apartments of uh, his disciples, his advanced disciples, right? And in an advanced disciples' living room, I would walk in where I was invited to stay overnight, and I would walk into a scene, coming with my bag and my beads and my shirt, where 
where the group would be sitting playing Monopoly on the floor <laughs> with a turkey on the dining table. They sit in chairs with a turkey on the table, a brandy from the liquor shelf, which is full, television blaring, the kids playing, um, the New Yorker and Saturday Review in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> You know, I kept thinking, geez, this is a throwback. To th I've already been through this one somewhere. You know, this is like Harvard did it 12 years ago. You know. And I thought, what has this got to do with coming to God? What could this be about? What is he doing here? Is this black magic? Am I being had? Because as opposed to that, I'd say go to Swami Satchidananda's ashram for 10 days. Where by the tenth day of nine days of silence and everybody's up early doing asanas and eating pure food, everybody's stoned out of their heads. And they're all just, hello. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody's seeing God everywhere they look. It's really far enough. Now, what could those two trips, you know, after all, we're being offered these as teachings. So what teachings do I get out of it? I'll share with that. Because I notice when people are saying to me, who do you think Trungpa Rinpoche is? I'm going through these long explanations about his childhood in Tibet. So in order to justify the behavior now, saying you'd never buy it for what it is, but if you realize that he was a tuku and at 18 months he was picked by the oracles and raised with a hundred tutors and all this stuff, and he escaped, to, you know, leaving his monastery behind him and all that. Then everybody would say, oh, he drinks. What <laughs> 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 a drunk. <laughs> Far up. He has the credentials, but he's pushing right to the edge, as you can see. I mean, one more push and he's over the edge. He's that, you know, that llama that went bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting these strange things like Lama Govinda says to me in, uh, was it, did you say this in Almora about something? He said, um, well, it's too bad what he's doing in America because it's bad for Buddhism. <laughs> so I got no investment in Buddhism. I mean, it's like a, this beautiful Jewish boy went to study at a Zen monastery, Kasahari, actually, and he flipped out some years back. And uh, he had been in New Hampshire at RC, a beautiful kid, Fred. And he, he was in a mental hospital in uh, Cleveland. He used to call me up on the phone. His mother had put him there. And um, he'd say, I'd talk to him about his mother. And I, he'd say, you know, when I talk to her about Buddhism, the Cleveland Jewish woman, when I talk to her about Buddhism, she gets furious. But when I, when I become Buddhist, she doesn't mind at all. <laughs> and that's roughly um, the way I feel about Buddhism, per se, you know. I feel that, let's be Buddha. And um, I honor the system, and I heard what Govinda was talking about, but... Um, I wasn't sure that wasn't reflecting an attachment on his part to the scholarship or to the... I mean, there's a, like a beautiful Buddhist meditation. If you're meditating and you meet the Buddha, slay him. Wipe him out. Don't get hung up worshiping him. And then another very beautiful Lama, I'm not sure whether this is Kalo or not, but said about Trungpa, he said, somebody was complaining to him that... Um, the students were starting to drink and smoke and uh, <coughs> lie around, etc., just as Trungpa was doing. And this Lama in uh, India said, when you go to the mountain, the top of a mountain with a bird, and the bird flies, don't think you can. <laughs> it's Kalu, Kalu Rinpoche, one of the heads of the Kajupa line of which Trungpa is in that tradition, that lineage. So I put down, it's merely saying, like Maharaji saying to me, get rid of anger. Say, so where you're at, do it. But, and don't make believe you're somewhere else. That's what the Gita says. It says, don't do another's dharma. That's a dharma. Don't do another person's trip. Do your own trip.
Well, the thing that the reason I hung in with Trumpa uh, during this period was that I recognized the kind of sickness that had developed in the Western spiritual scene. It wasn't a sickness, it was merely a root through, but it had a neurotic quality to it, let's put it that way. And that quality was that a lot of people got busy being holy, thinking holiness. They were sort of coming on holy to themselves and to everybody else. And I was one of the chief um, perpetuators of that thing. I mean, I used to have the identity. I would meet in front of you five years ago, and I'd be wearing white uh, stuff, you know, my dhoti and my korta and my bead. Then afterwards, I'd take them off, and I'd go to a dark part of town with a pizza parlor, <laughs> and I'd sneak in and I'd eat pizza. You know? okay. <laughs> Let alone everything else. Right? <laughs> and that was just like the days further back when I used to, in 1966, when I lectured for the National Institute of Mental Health about LSD. I was the bad guy on a good panel. Our guys were going around telling deans of universities that they had a drug problem. And I used to go into the bathroom before the lecture and take my little bit of hash and my pin and, and then come out and be holy, be very high. And they'd say, well, whatever he took, it certainly worked. But I couldn't tell him I'd just taken it. Because they were full of FBI and CIA. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the Wyoming seminar, I finally asked for an interview with uh, Trumpa. And I came into the room, and he was sitting. There was, uh, I had been to a movie in his room the night before, actually. He was showing a movie he was very fond of, a Japanese film called uh, Women of the Beach, or Women of the Dunes. Women of the Dunes. It's a really high film, really high. It's his really favorite film, really big. And in the course of it, the screen was tipped over, the, he was drunk, the babies were vomiting all over the floor, and the whole scene was just total, total trunfa, you know. It was a, and at the end of it, he said, well, what did you think that film was about? And he just set me up, you know, and then whatever I said, I was a total fool, and uh, I went out of there feeling like a bumbling idiot. But I asked for an interview, and I came in, and I said to him, uh, well, uh, I seem to be with you now. Obviously, you are what my guru wants as my teaching. What is my teaching? What am I doing here? Do you have anything to tell me? What should I do next? So he said, well, he said, uh, you should, you've been doing a lot of Vipassana meditation. You should meditate with Maha Vipassana, just expanding outward. Just breathe out, expand outward in the universe. She said, why don't we try it? So we sat down facing each other in two upright chairs with a wooden tater between us with a sake bottle. <laughs> and we look into each other's eyes, which we've been doing since the beginning anyway. And um, about 20 seconds went by and he said to me, I think you're still trying. And I said, yeah, I think so too. He says, no, don't try. Okay. And then it just, um, he just disintegrated. And um, after the moment of that, he said, well, I think you understand the meditation. And that was the end of that interview. And he said to me, um, I said, well, I'm going in a retreat for a month. And he said, well, I said, I'll take my tambour and my books. And he said, no, why don't you just take the third Chinese patriarch of Zen, which is a little, uh, about five page, I said, okay. Well, that was the last I saw of him until Tale of the Tiger, which was about two months ago. And I went to Tale to pick up on one of his lectures. He was lecturing on uh, Don Juan. And I was sitting in the VW bus when somebody came up and said, Trumpa would like to see you. So I went to see Trumpa. And I came into the room. And he was so convivial and friendly. He was just like another guy. Right? Just hanging out. He talked about his wife's antique business. 
and I told him what an economic slob I thought he was and his whole organization. I said, I assume you're very high. You must know what you're doing, but it looks like economic chaos to me. He says, yes, I'm going to get tough with everybody. <laughs> but the thing that threw me was that at first, when I walked in, what he said to me was, and this is the crux of this whole story, actually. He said to me, Ramdas, this is a critical period, and we must accept responsibility. To which my response was, you must be putting me on. I mean, this was an honest response. I'm looking right in his eyes. You must be putting me on, because he's a person I trust his conscience. I said, I don't live in time. What's critical about this time? Time is time. It's all critical. And as far as my responsibility, it's all God's responsibility. What are you talking to me for? I talk to Sam. I'm really an instrument. I don't want to and he says, no, he says, you, you've got to understand. This is a time you've got to assume responsibility. I said, well, you're obviously farther out than I am. So if you say so, I'll certainly think about it. I don't know what will happen, but, you know, since it's so strange, I'll think about it. Well, it was very convivial, and then we went to the lecture. We didn't go together, and I sat in the back of the room, way back there, to minding my own business. And he was lecturing on Don Juan. And after about 20 minutes, he said, any questions? Somebody asked a question, and Trump just said, why don't we let Ramdas answer that? I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> so I stood up, and I gave a, an answer. It was something about the ashramas in India, the systems, the different stages of life. And I sat down. The next question, Trump just said, why doesn't Ramdas come up here and sit up here with me? <laughs> So I went up, and the stage was set up. It was a very small podium. He was sitting on it with his sake bottle and a table next to him, and then a vase of flowers next to that, a goldenrod, very high vase. And behind the goldenrod, there was a square of about a foot and a half that I could kneel on, because I had a needle to see over the goldenrod. So I knelt there, and he immediately turned to me, and he says, what do you think of sorcerers? This is a seminar on Don Juan. So I said, well, I don't think anything of sorcerers. I said, they're not my business. I said, I, uh, my sadhana, my discipline is devotion towards the one, and I just keep moving towards the one, and all the stuff along the way is just stuff along the way, whether it's astral or physical, it's just more stuff. <coughs> he says, you're copping out. So he kept pushing me about responsibility and about all of this, and I kept struggling back. And this struggle that we were having at that moment really represents two different disciplines. He's talking to me about Tantra, which is the method of using the energies in the world and working with that energy. And I'm talking about the surrender part of it, and the devotional service surrender. This is just a different form of yoga. <clears throat> well, that whole debate ended up that I was sitting behind the goldenrod while some fellow was raising money for Tail the Tiger, and I had my eyes closed, and apparently Trunka reached over and he flipped the cigarette ash on the top of my head, <laughs> which I didn't realize because my eyes were closed and I was listening. But everybody laughed, and I assumed he had done something, either at the expense of me or the fellow that was speaking. But my whole reaction to all of this, I lo when Trump was challenging me and saying, copping out, come on, come on, and this is with 250 people and a television camera, and I suddenly looked down, and I noticed I'm wearing a cardigan sweater, and I buttoned it wrong. <laughs> and my face is red and sweating, and I think, far out, that bass is getting to me. Aren't you wonderful? And I just looked with him with incredible love, like, thank you, you know. He's... And I then got the up-level realization that he was teaching a seminar in Don Juan, and that he had just made me Carlos Castaneda, so he could play Don Juan, right? There I was, the bumbling intellectual who didn't know, you know, which end was up, and there he was, just cutting me to shreds. 
And then when we got all done and I sat down, then he ultimately gave me his blessing, which is the sacred ash. I got the end of a cigarette. <laughs> you can't ask, and then there's the whole Tibetan tradition of the joust as a way of challenging somebody. You see, when they want to challenge somebody, they just debate and ask questions. It's just that I hadn't known what the game was until I found myself in the middle of it. So it was quite a joyful thing from my part. Um, other people, like the Village Voice, saw it as a power struggle. <laughs> and thought that Trinkle was very infantile to flick ashes on my head. <laughs> no, the Village Voice didn't. Someone else did them, in fairness to the voice. Okay, so then two days later, I get a letter from Trunkless saying, um, your visit was very nice. And here is a medallion in honor of the work you and I will do together in the future. <laughs> I mean, it's so beautiful the way he plays, you know. Uh, those of you who don't know the Trunkless stories, the stories connect with all these guys, you know. Trunkless is the guy, he walked into a, bar, a pool hall in the Midwest, was it? Mm -hmm and with three of his devotees and he was drunk when he walked in and he came up to a fellow who was just about to take his flu shot who was very tough looking what might be, I don't know, called a redneck or whatever that cultural label is and just as the guy was going to take his shot Trump fell against him and the guy missed his shot and he turned around and as he turned Trump shot him in the face with a water pistol <laughs> Led, um, <laughs> the man to say, get that fucking chink out of here. <laughs> and they quickly led this uh, stumbling out of the bar, around the back to the car where the pool player and two of his friends were standing now by the car, as I am told the story, with guns, ready to take care of the trunk butt now. And the cool, clear night air. Trunkla hobbled up to them, and he looks up at them, and he just stops and looks at them. And then after about 30 seconds, he just goes and gets in the car and they drive away. That's a Trunkla story, just so you keep in mind the, the power tripping aspect of the universe. <laughs> The next encounter we have is the Dharma Festival in Boston a weekend or so ago. And that starts out on a Friday morning with a television show Trump and I do, do together at 9 in the morning. Trump comes in, Trump comes in sober, absolutely together, perfectly straight. It's Paul Benzaquin, yeah. And uh, it was a very pleasant show, right? Very pleasant. Then we were to do another interview for a Sunday show called um, Plowshares, something like that, Sunday morning show. And I was to interview Trumpa, and I was told to ask him about his lineage. So I said to him, would you tell me about your lineage, Trumpa? Well, what's the function of lineage? He says, well, the value of lineage is, is it keeps you from getting caught in thinking you're it. Because he says, you realize you're merely the carrier of the jewel. But that you're in a long line of previous carriers of the jewel, and that you get out of the criticalness of this moment and your role, and you just assume that. I said to him, well, Trump, if I can remind you of our previous conversation, you said to me, I have to assume the responsibility. And I don't understand. He says, well, you have to identify with being the vehicle. I said, well, can't the precious jewel carry itself? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you hear the dialogue that's going on? I mean, a little game we're playing here. And he said, well, it's a very delicate line. Right? It's a very delicate line. And what you can hear about that delicate line is something that I've been interestingly acting and reacting about for a long time. Is that I come out of the tradition, the... Uh, tradition of Maharaji, where if Maharaji does something and I say to him, that was a fantastic thing you did, he says, I did nothing, and he points up and he says, God did it all, or Hanuman did it, I can do nothing, 
And that's the one of not me, not me, not me, it, it, it. And then it's the identification in one direction. Because if you look at the spiritual traditions, or the way you got your connection through beings and so on, you see that one being opens to it and, if you will, surrenders to it with legs spread wide and arms out, come on, baby, come on, and gives in its total receptivity to the forces of the universe. The forces of the universe pour through the individual, and then everybody that meets that individual experiences them as just power itself. But it's interesting because the tradition I'm in, the being, to the extent that you can ever get a social statement of the, out of them of who they think they are or who they're being, they're always being that one upward. And Trumpet is saying to me, you have to assume responsibility for being the one downward as well as the one upward. And I always saw everybody that was coming up to me and saying, we've got work to do or assume responsibility or anything, it's just power tripping. <laughs> And I realized that the, what I was hearing was my own confusion about power. With my zeal to get rid of it, I was refusing to participate in it, which was as much attachment to it as if I had brutally collected it. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas' work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you.